Hi everybody, I know it's been uh, quite a while since I did a video um, and I'd like to apologize uh, for how long this has taken. I've just been extremely busy and a little bit sick. If I look a little rough around the edges, it's because I haven't been well. <coughs> also, if my voice sounds a little deeper than normal, uh, that's what that's all about. Um, and this is this is just going to be an off-the-cuff video. I don't know whether that's such a good idea considering the subject matter that I've chosen. Um, but I just felt like I, I sat down and I tried to write something about this and, and it just was not working. I think I've been trying for about four days and uh, I have some dark circles under my eyes uh, right now. And then they're a little bit puffy because I, I didn't really sleep very well last night, kind of racking my brain trying to uh, decide how to approach a script for this particular video and uh, and yeah so um, I think I'm just gonna try and wing it and see how that works and uh, um, I just it, it's a very very difficult topic I think it's a difficult topic for anybody who chooses to talk about it except maybe feminists um, who seem to feel like it's the easiest thing to discuss um, and the easiest kind of uh, bullshit to, uh, the easiest poop to fling. So, uh, Anders Breivik. So, uh, about uh, a week, maybe a week and a half ago, somebody, uh, one of my viewers sent me an article, a link to an article. Uh, I believe it was in the Daily Mail. Uh, UK, uh, but uh, there, there's been, or The Telegraph, The Telegraph, and the title of the article, I'm going to leave the link in the low bar, is Anders Bering Breivik's mother sexualized him when he was four. And uh, I'm just going to read the article, uh, it's not very long. Um, Norway killer Anders Bering Breivik's mother sexualized her four-year-old son, smacked him and often told him she wished he were dead, child psychologist reports printed in a new book on the Norwegian killer have revealed. The reports also show that when Brevik was just four years old, his mother became preoccupied with fears that her son would violently assault someone. She saw him as an adult violent person, even though he was only a small boy, said Ag Age Borsgrevink. I hope I pronounced that right author of A Norwegian Tragedy. She was afraid that he would assault people. The psychologist reports show that Wenke Bering already felt her son was aggressive, hyperactive, and clingy when she was breastfeeding him. By the time he was four years old, she sexualized the young Brevik, hit him, and frequently told him that she wished he were dead. The mother and Anders sleep in the same bed at night with very close bodily contact, psychologists from Norway's Center for Child and Youth Psychiatry reported after Brevik and his mother spent several weeks there in 1983. The family's neighbors at the time became worried about her inappropriate sexual behavior. During the police investigation, the neighbors also said that they had been shocked by the mother's sexualized language, Borsch Grevink writes. There was a lot of fighting in the apartment, and they remembered sexual activity taking place while the, while the children were in there. Uh, the psychiatrist's report described Ms. Baring as a woman with an extremely difficult upbringing, borderline personality structure, and an all-encompassing, if only partially visible, depression, who, quote, projects her primitive, aggressive, and sexual fantasies onto him, Brevik. The psychologists reported that she would frequently tell her son that she wished he would die. She shifts very quickly between speaking to him with a sugary voice and openly expressing a death wish, they wrote. When she smacked him in an attempt to exert control, the four-year-old would taunt her that the blows did not hurt, smiling in a way she found condescending, inappropriate, and derisive. Borsch Grevink, a novelist, has faced criticism in Norway for his decision to publish excerpts from the reports, with some accusing him of violating the privacy of Ms. Bering, who was admitted to a psychiatric ward the day after her son killed 77 people in his bomb and gun rampage in July 2011. Ms. Bering was excused from testifying in the trial this summer on health grounds and refused to give permission for the psychologist who examined the family in 1983 and 84 to give evidence 
preventing the information published last week from being heard in court. After Brevik's father, Jens Brevik, lost a child custody case with Ms. Baring, social workers recommended that the boy nonetheless be removed from his mother to prevent more severe psychopathology from developing, a request that was ignored. Borschgreving said, It was this that had convinced him that he was right to publish. I've given more weight to the public interest. The fact is that he was actually caught by the system before the action, not by the security police, but in his childhood. He was within the system, but the system let him go. Brevik was sentenced to 21 years in jail for his attacks in August, which he claimed was necessary to alert Norway to the threat posed by Islamic immigration. Now, once I had read that, I, uh, I went and I did some digging, um, and, uh, and I found that there had been several articles uh, written on these particular facts that were revealed in this book. Um, you know, articles in UK papers, in Norwegian newspapers, all of that stuff, right? And all of them dwelling on these particular uh, facts. And uh, with, with a little bit of, uh, a couple of them had sort of uh, getting quotes from, you know, a psychological expert, blah, 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 um, or a political analyst. But one thing that really struck me, because these uh, articles are almost uniformly at least a month old, um, there have been, uh, to my knowledge, um, no opinion pieces, at least a Google search of the name of the book and the name of the author, uh, don't reveal any opinion pieces in the first three pages of Google results on, you know, what, what a columnist or a pundit or, you know, some person who writes an opinion column on what they think of what was revealed. It's almost as if nobody wants to really look at any of this and examine it. And, uh, and frankly, like, I don't want to look at any of this and examine it, but it's just, it's, it's a, it's a huge conflict in me as far as like you, it's like rubbernecking at a car accident, you know, like you can't help but look, but you, you just don't want to see what's there. Um, but when, when I did, uh, some other digging, um, I, I'm going to sort of give the, the basics of, of what I know of his sort of life story, and, uh, and we'll see what, uh, what we can, uh, what conclusions we might be able to reach from what information is available. And, and I would really, really appreciate it. I know I have at least a couple of very supportive viewers in Norway. This book was written in Norwegian, so I have no idea what else it contains. Um, so if there, if, if my viewers in Norway read the book and I get anything, you know, egregiously wrong, um, uh, any assumptions or speculations that I make in this, in this video, if you could just let me know and I will amend the video with like a speech bubble or, or whatever. But from what I dug up, Jens Brevik and uh, Wenke Bering uh, lived in London. Jens was a diplomat, a uh, Norwegian diplomat at the Norwegian Embassy in London, and later on he was transferred to the Embassy in Paris. So he basically is one of those people that he goes where his government tells him to go. And uh, they were married when Brevik was born. I think his daughter, or I think her, his, his sister was a half-sister, if I recall correctly. I could be wrong about that. But um, when he was a year old, his parents split up. And uh, his mother moved with the kids back to Norway. And, uh, and there followed a, a bitter custody battle, bitter usually meaning lengthy and expensive, uh, which the mother won. And one thing that I found really kind of interesting about that is that, uh, at least according to some sources, she had decided when he was still in the womb, 
when Brevik was still in the womb, she had decided that he was going to be a problem. She had she she had decided that he was aggressive and and going to be an angry, horrible person, uh, and a difficult child because he kicked a fair bit. He probably kicked more than you know than she would have expected. Or you know, I've experienced the same thing. You know, my third kid kicked constantly. He was his head was out when he was still kicking. So um, she had decided while she was still pregnant with him that he was a, a difficult and unruly child. And it just strikes me as bizarre that she would win a custody battle against somebody who obviously had the respect of society and all kinds of resources and, and all of that. And who, as far as I know, has not come under any kind of real scrutiny. Um, there was nothing really printed about uh, Jens Brevik's role in his kid's life other than to say that, you know, Anders visited him often and in London and, and in Paris and, uh, and that he wasn't there, right? So I, I don't understand how this woman who um, had this obviously bizarre relationship with her son even before he was born. It's this, these kind of twisted ideas of, of who he was even before he was born uh, had decided that even when he was breastfeeding that he was, you know, hyperactive and aggressive and clingy. Um, that how, how could she, how could she win custody? Now, Another thing that I was wondering is uh, whether any of this stuff with this psychiatric assessment done by these psychologists at the Center for Child Psychiatry or whatever it was, um, I, I, I have to wonder whether any of that uh, information was shared with Brevik's father. Because it, it would seem to me and, uh, and I hope someone will correct me if I'm wrong, but it would seem to me that if I received uh, a report like that from a Center for Child Psychiatry or from social workers, that my son was being abused by his mother, that he was recommended to be removed from her care, uh, any of that, I would have launched another custody battle. And I have not found any evidence that uh, that Brevik's father did this when he was three or four years old. Um, that it seems to me that this is maybe something that nobody bothered to tell him. And uh, and if they did, and he did nothing, or if they did, and he tried again and and was not successful, um, I hope someone who has read the book will let me know. But what it looks like to me is uh, that the default mother custody female favoring in family court, that seems to be across the board in every feminist culture, every culture that has uh, had a women's rights movement, um, that this is probably uh, it, this huge, huge part of what turned this boy into the man that he became, and uh, that I have heard people say that the father was not there, and they say it in this kind of just offhand way, but when I read more, you know, he, he visited his father often, and uh, so, I mean, his father was there. His father was likely there as much as the custody agreement allowed. And uh, up until Anders was 15 or 16. And uh, it just it just strikes me as society's immense bias toward favoring mothers in family court and in giving single mothers the benefit of the doubt. Um, this this attitude that if she's abusing her child, it's because she's struggling. It's because her situation is bad. 
It's because she's so stressed out by how alone she is. Um, it, it, there is never any, uh, well, not never, but I mean, the last thing people want to look at is that maybe it's her fault. Maybe, maybe this is just her, right? Her behavior. It's, she's always reacting to something. She's slipping through the cracks, blah, blah, blah. Um, another thing that, that really, uh, really got me was that, um, setting aside the fact that the court, um, the court ordered a, an initial psychiatric assessment of Brevik and the finding came back that he was paranoid schizophrenic. And there was such an outcry among the public and the media and especially the families of the victims, uh, one of whom was the stepbrother of the Crown Princess of Norway, so some of these, these victims were extremely important people and influential people, um, that, that there was uh, a second assessment ordered by the court. Uh, and that finding was one of narcissistic personality disorder. And I remember reading a quote from a, a psychology expert um, on how there's no proof that his upbringing, there's no proof that what his mother did to him led him to have this personality disorder and led him to do these things. And uh, what got me was that the, the child psychologists were, used the words, or the, the social workers used the words psychopathology referring to him at age three or four. And even if it was narcissistic personality disorder, all I had to do was Google the words personality disorder and attachment and came up with something called attachment theory, which posits that in order to develop a normal personality, a child has to have a stable and, uh, trustworthy bond with the primary caregiver in the earliest stages of life, um, right from birth all the way through, you know, to at least age three or four, that that relationship has to be seen by the child as a safe home base and, uh, and that the child then can venture out from that relationship and explore the world. And if the child finds that the world painful or frightening or whatever, they can come back to their safe home base and be assured that it's safe, that they're safe. And here we have this woman who right from the word go um, is alternately, you know, uh, sucking her child into some bizarre sexual dynamic uh, loaded with sugary words and affection and then, like, two minutes later, screaming at him that I wish you were dead and smacking him upside the head. This is, this is not a safe and trustworthy relationship. This is not a safe home base for a child. And the issue is, is that, uh, as it's presented in attachment theory, is that you model, uh, you form a model of w how the world works, uh, what other people are to you, what they're like, uh, what their purpose is, um, how you're supposed to interact with them, how you're supposed to feel about them, um, what your relationships with them are supposed to be. You form all of those things from the initial model that you have in your brain of that primary caregiver, the initial relationship. This is one reason why uh, for a while there back in, I think it was the early 90s, there was a huge amount of news stories about uh, people who adopted orphaned children from Pol uh, from Romania and stuff like that who were raised in orphanages and then getting these kids who were like completely fucking psycho at age five and, you know, ripping the house apart and trying to stab their adoptive siblings and stuff like that. And, and it's because these babies were left in their cribs for like 23 and a half hours a day um, without any kind of human interaction or contact, sometimes for a year or a year and a half of their lives right at the beginning, and they formed no attachment. They never learn to see people as people. People are 
categorized in a different way with these kids. And uh, they, it, it's, it's almost like pure solipsism. How does this person affect me? And that's all, all it is. It's, everybody else is just a hologram, right? And the only way to interact or to think of other people is how they affect me in the moment. So, uh, we, we really, we have this kid who, who was basically just destroyed by the relationship with his mother. And frankly, um, I don't know how useful it is to blame her. Um, like I certainly have no sympathy for her whatsoever. And, and what I find really, uh, just absolutely telling is that here she had uh, the ability to allow or to block testimony that would provide uh, a mitigating circumstance uh, at his trial, at her son's trial. And frankly, if, if I felt like uh, there was something, if my son had done something that was horrendous, if I felt that there was something that could help him in some way as far as... Uh, getting treatment rather than punishment or, you know, or being considered as far as a mitigating circumstance went, um, I think that I, I would just have to allow that. I would have to allow that evidence to be heard. And she, uh, apparently, um, cause there was nobody, nobody threatening to prosecute her for what she did. Um, it, it was strictly, uh, a matter of, I don't want people to or, or to see uh, see those things that I did. Um, I don't want people to know that about me. I don't want to have the public backlash. I don't want to, you know. And uh, I just I just found that to just be a really really atrocious decision, a heartless and cold decision on her part, and. Uh, I also, uh, I look at how on earth the judge could, uh, could rule that her privacy outweighed, uh, evidence. And it's not even exculpatory evidence. It's, it's not even evidence that would have gotten him off the hook. It's just evidence that would have maybe changed the nature of his sentence or the length of his sentence. Um, might even have, uh, have added time to his sentence because he, this is a person who is obviously irreparably broken and can never be trusted out in society. Um, and when it comes to certain kinds of damage, psychological damage that we can inflict on children when, when they're very, very young, um, there's really no recovering from that for, for some children. There's just certain kinds of damage are permanent. So I, I don't understand what the motivation of the judge was other than to protect this woman who really I don't feel deserves to be protected um, from the consequences of her own behavior and uh, she's certainly not going to be punished in any court of law for what she inflicted on her son or held responsible for her part in what happened what he did when he was uh, an adult um, What, what bothered me too was that, uh, that Brevik has stated in the past that he had a decent childhood, that he had a good childhood. And, uh, and when anybody probes further, uh, he, he just clams right up. Um, this is, this is all he has ever said. I had a good childhood. And then no comment, right? Or I'm not going to answer that. And part of me is uh, is wondering whether this is a way of avoiding um, something that would be extremely traumatic to him. Um, I, I have no doubt that he would never have allowed his lawyer to even even uh, 
enter, let alone, or even, even entertain uh, an insanity plea. Um, in his mind, what he did was righteous, right? What he did was, uh, it was necessary. It was regrettable, but necessary. He saw himself as a knight, a knight templar. And, uh, and the savior, essentially, uh, of Norway. You know, I am saving them from what's to come 20 years from now if they keep going the way they're going. They're going. And, and his writings, the letters that he's sent uh, from prison to people who have written to him, uh, reflect that. He's, he's asked people, you know, has society adopted any of my ide ideas yet, right? You know, like, he sees himself as a visionary. He sees himself as somebody who sees what's coming and did what was absolutely necessary um, had the courage to do what was necessary to try and prevent that. And, uh, if he actually ever stopped to ponder that, uh, that he was damaged psychologically by his upbringing, he would have to entertain the possibility that what he did wasn't righteous and wasn't necessary and, uh, and wasn't the right thing to do. And it was just the act of a person who was psychologically damaged. It was just, it was just a monstrosity and an abomination. That, that's what he would have to consider if he actually stopped and examined the possibility that maybe he's crazy. And he's not going to want to do that. Uh, that's, that would be an extremely traumatic realization uh, to come to that, oh my god, I fucking killed 77 people who didn't have to die, who, you know, over something that really isn't the case, uh, it was completely unjustified, what the fuck have I done? He, he's, he's going to do his best to avoid having to even look at any of that, so he would never in a million years have presented an insanity defense. Valerie Solanus was the same way, right? I have nothing to regret. Everything I did was justified. Um, this, is, this is how crazy people behave, right? This is this, they, they don't think they're crazy, and they'll do everything in their power to not have to examine the fact that just maybe they're fucking crazy. Now, Regardless of uh, of any of of this, um, another thing that kind of bothered me um, was that uh, the press made a, a really big deal about Brevik's father saying that he wished his son had killed himself, and and I'm not sure whether. Um, that was said in the context of, I wish he had killed himself before he killed all of those people, or I wish he had killed himself like most people who go postal do um, after they kill a bunch of people, they blow their own brains out. Um, but regardless, uh, it, there was a great deal made of that, and a great deal made of the fact that uh, Brevik's mother um, stated that his father cut off contact when he was uh, tagged for I don't know the, how many of the time by police for spraying graffiti uh, on buildings in Oslo. That uh, you know that that there's there's this desire to pin some kind of malice or uh, or some kind of failure on Bredick's father. Um, I just want to say that if my son had killed 77 people, I think there would be a part of me that wished that he had killed himself, himself before he did it. Um, there might even be a part of me that wished he killed himself after he did it. Um, it's just something that you don't want to deal with. You, it, It's this bizarre conflict between still loving your child, even knowing that they've done something just absolutely monstrous, 
and uh, I don't know whether I would have ever voiced that uh, thought, um, but I, I can I can't even imagine what his father, especially a father who had fought for custody and lost, a father who had been there, um, you know, as as much as was allowed. A father who was really essentially helpless to uh, help his son um, or to save his son, uh, who was not given the information, not given the uh, the relevant information as far as how his son was actually doing. Um, I think it, it would it would be a natural inclination that after your kid does something like that and you have to look at them um, it would just be extremely difficult to uh, to reconcile the fact that you still love them with what they did um, and the easiest thing would be for them to not be there anymore. Because then you would just wouldn't have to look at them. Or at least that's maybe what you would think. You would think that I don't have to look at him or I don't have to think about him because he's not here anymore. And uh, it, it just, it, it very much upset me how the press, um, sorry, kind of glommed onto that, uh, probably very unguarded statement, um, because it's, it's an extremely human reaction to something of this nature, um, and I don't think that it's one that most people would even really understand because they, they couldn't imagine being in that position, they couldn't imagine a reality in which they would ever be in that position, and, uh, um, and, and it, it really, uh, it frustrated me all the times that I heard or read the phrase and the father wasn't there because he was there. Uh, the mother, uh, Ms. Baring claimed that after, uh, after Anders got arrested, uh, yet again for graffiti, um, his father cut off all contact, but... Uh, Jens Brevik has clarified, he's since stated that, uh, that no, no, it was, it was Anders who cut off contact with him and he would have welcomed him. Uh, he still loved, you know, I still love my son. Of course I would be, I would welcome my son. And when I think of how to measure the credibility of those two statements and you know I look at this woman who who checked herself into a mental institution pretty much the moment she found out what her son has, had done and used that as an excuse not to testify so that her part in all of this wouldn't come out and uh, you know, a, a woman who, like I said, decided when her son was still in the womb that he was essentially a horrible person. And then, I guess, I don't know, set about torturing and beating that out of him. Um, I, I, look at, I look at these two people, a, a diplomat, you know, somebody who's trusted um, by his government, uh, who doesn't seem to have... I mean, there was nothing salacious uh, in any of the articles written about that book uh, in regard to Brevik's father, other than the statement that he he said he wished his son had killed himself, um, or that and that he wasn't there. And uh, and I look at these two people, and uh, I I kind of have to give the edge as far as credibility to uh, Jens Brevik. That, that it really wasn't his decision. Um, he's not the one who cut off contact. And 
um, again, what what I find really disturbing is that uh, Anders was brought to the attention of Child Protective Services uh, again when he was 13 for the uh, the tagging of buildings um, for his graffiti, and uh, again, nothing was done, right? And and it, it I look at Brevik as well. Um, you know, I want to hate him, but then, you know, you read something, uh, from a former classmate of his in middle school that said that he stood up for people who were being bullied, right? Um, that he was, that was, he was bright and, uh, and he, he was compassionate toward people who, uh, who he thought were being bullied. And the whole thing just, it's, I think it's just a lot more complicated than we've been allowed to, uh, to think or to believe. And I really have to wonder why nobody in, uh, nobody in the press wants to really express an opinion on these revelations that came out in this book. Um, are we, are we all like the judge in that case? You know, are we all, well, her, we, her privacy counts more than knowing the truth and, uh, and oh, it would really hurt her for this to be discussed. Um, do we have so much sympathy for the woman who created the man who did that? Um, are we so unwilling to look at the uh, social and legal norms that led to this? If Brevik, the terrorist, Brevik the killer, Brevik the Knight Templar, was created in the first five years of his life, then a system that refuses to hold women accountable, refuses to do things, uh, make decisions that would harm them or hurt them or upset them, right from custody to we should remove him from her care except, oh, that poor woman, she's a single mother and we should just give her the benefit of the doubt. Part of me is uh, part of me is thinking that uh, as much as feminists want to lay Anders Brevik on the doorstep of the MRN, he really belongs on the doorstep of feminism because it's all of the legal and cultural norms of a feminist society that allowed his mother to do what she did to him for long enough that she fucked him up for life. And as much as I don't want to blame somebody who is obviously, I, the, the psychologist said she was borderline personalities, that's not her fault, right? Um, it's not her fault that she had a difficult upbringing, that she was damaged by her own upbringing. The norms that have been brought about by feminism, um, default mother custody, uh, you know, looking at a man who seeks custody as a potential abuser who just wants to continue to abuse his children, um, rooting for women because they're weaker and they deserve extra help um, and, and extra support. Letting women off the hook for their bad behavior because, hey, it's not, it's, it's never her, it's her situation that's to blame. These are norms that are, uh, they're universal in any society that has had a strong women's movement. And uh, those norms 
are what allowed uh, Anders Breivik to be essentially tormented all through his early life by his mother and, uh, and twisted to the point where he doesn't see the people that he killed as people. He sees them as, uh, as pawns on the chessboard. And uh, he sees himself as the center of the universe. And, uh, and this, uh, I just, if, if there is any ideology that needs to uh, take a really good look at Anders Breivik and a really good look at the ways that they've contributed to the circumstances that led him to be the way he was, then that would be feminism. And you know, honestly, they fling that poo at us in the MRM constantly. Anders Breivik was an MRA. No. Anders Breivik was one fucked up dude. And the thing that fucked him up was the cultural and legal norms that were brought about by feminism. And uh, if feminism has the guts to uh, take a look at that shit, take ownership of some of it, I might actually have a little bit of respect for them. But at the moment, it seems like nobody wants to even look at this stuff. So, anyhow, that's all I have to say about that. I know this is a really long video and it was kind of rambly and, and all of that and I apologize but um, I guess it's just I just there were some things that I had to sort of get off my chest and uh, hopefully the next video will be uh, scripted and much less choppy and disjointed so, um, yeah, I guess I'll see y'all later.